can do single qubit gates, and we also looked at interacting ions. And now, today, I want to start looking at the interaction between electromagnetic radiation and trapped ions or trapped atoms. Actually, what I'm going to do now, most of it is also applicable to uh, any particle in a trap, any particle that has an internal structure in a trap. Okay, but first I need some space. Okay, so what we want to look at is at the interaction between trapped ions. And like I said, this could be, you can replace this with neutral atoms or something with electromagnetic radiation. So that's the, what we will do here on the black dot. Um, okay, so where do we start? We, let's start with a picture. We have a very simplified view of our ion, of course. We only talk about qubits, so just two states that are relevant, zero and one. The energy separation is <clears throat> given by omega, and then we have the atom in a trap, so we have a harmonic oscillator coupled to the ion, so that has energy levels separated by frequency nu, angular frequency nu. And then, in addition, we have some uh, radiation field. Uh, I'm talking about two stable levels of the ion that do not decay, like metastable states, or hyperfine states. So this omega could be in the optical regime, it could be in the radio frequency regime. So what I'm going to show you now is completely general. No particular assumption on omega and on this trapping potential. Okay, so now we have some radiation coupling, <clears throat> yeah, you will see that this will couple the internal and the external dynamics. That's what we want to uh, see in the end. And so we have radiation, near resonant radiation at, at a frequency omega L. And, okay, so, and then we have uh, a coupling between the atomic dipole or quadrupole or whatever we consider. So if you have a dipole, then your interaction Hamiltonian is simply, call it HL, then this is simply given by minus D dot E. So that's the, can be the electric dipole moment of the atom coupling to the electric field or it could be a magnetic moment of the atom coupling to, um, let's do this explicitly, minus mu dot B, so that's a magnetic moment coupling to a magnetic field. Okay, so, um, but first let me specify this field here. So the field, I call it, yeah, so I call the field now F, and F can stand for either E or B. So F has, like I wrote down yesterday already, some unit vector that indicates the polarization, some amplitude, and then it's uh, supposed to be a traveling wave, a linearly polarized traveling wave. So we have, for the traveling wave, that's k times z, so the wave is traveling along the z direction. k is the, is the wave number, so k is 2 pi over lambda. 
<coughs> lambda is the wavelength of your radiation, omega is the frequency, and phi is the phase. So you just have a traveling wave, and then uh, you can write your interaction Hamiltonian, this HL, as, so I'm just, um, you can write this as h bar omega Rabi frequency, that's what I introduced yesterday. So the Rabi frequency h bar times the Rabi frequency is just, for instance, d dot e, or it's, or it's u dot mu dot b. So this gives you the energy, that's the interaction term. And then you have a term sigma x that couples your two uh, states. So th actually the internal Hamiltonian is given by one half h bar omega times sigma z. So that's the usual Pauli matrix that you know. So this is just a two-level system that can be described like a spin. So you have spin up or spin down. You can imagine this as being spin up or spin down in a magnetic field, for instance. And this is your Hamiltonian. This You all know Pauli matrices, right? Nobody shouts yes. Should I assume? <laughs> Okay, so let's, so this is our designated space for the basic stuff here. Let's uh, write them down. So that's just for our, two, we describe a, a spin one half or two level system. So we just need a two by two matrix and that's just sigma z. And then we have sigma x, which couples these two states. So if you have a sigma x term, they, you have a coupling between these two eigenstates, or you can have a sigma y term that looks like this. Sorry? Yes, minus. That would be the identity. Okay, so you know what Pauli matrix is. Very good. Okay, so um, here we have uh, the internal Hamiltonian, here we have the external Hamiltonian, and so this is just a quantum mechanical harmonic oscillator. So we have um, h, h bar times nu times a dagger a plus one half. So a dagger is the creation operator and annihilation operator for the harmonic oscillator. <clears throat> So the annihilation operator creates uh, one quantum of excitation and the creation operator creates one quantum of excitation and the annihilation operator gets rid of one quantum of excitation. So you probably all remember this from your quantum mechanics lecture. So um, if you should have any questions during the course of this further derivation, just interrupt me. Okay, so that's uh, internal and external Hamiltonian, and now we have this coupling between, so this is just the atom sitting in the trap, and now we add radiation. And that's what I want to look at now. So I look at the coupling Hamiltonian that couples um, the radiation to the trapped ion. Okay, so we have, that's the strength of the coupling, the energy of the coupling. That's the sigma x term that couples these two terms. And then we have, of course, our wave here. Okay, and we rewrite this um, in the following way. So sigma x I can write as sigma plus plus sigma minus. So those are the atomic raising and lowering operators. So sigma plus is just this matrix here. And sigma minus is 
this thing, and uh, if you apply this, okay, so and our, you've seen this yesterday, so zero in the bra cat notation is in the spino notation is this thing, and one in the bra cat notation is one zero. So now you see what these raising and lowering operators do. So if you apply sigma plus to your spin down state, you get, just multiply this, you get spin up. And if you apply sigma minus to spin up, you get spin down. So you flip the spin of your two-level system. So A and A dagger create and destroy excitation in the harmonic oscillator. Sigma minus and sigma plus create and destroy excitation in the atom. Okay, and the cosine term we write now in a slightly different form. So I'll simply write this down so that's easy to spot what I did here. And I have to include a factor one half because I have now two cosine terms and I have to get rid of one of them by this factor one half. Okay, so that's uh, just in a different form. And now, this is, I started with a classical wave here and I'm going to continue with a classical wave. So this is a semi-classical approach the radiation field is a classical field. The atom and the trap is quantum mechanical. Okay, now let's look at this set. So set is the position of the atom. And if I have a quantized harmonic oscillator, then I need to have a position operator. So set and the position operator, as you certainly recall from your quantum mechanics course, can be written as A dagger plus A times some unit vector. And this delta Z is just the extension of the ground state wave function of your harmonic oscillator. So what is the ground state wave function of the harmonic oscillator? <clears throat> what kind of function is that? Gaussian, exactly. So <clears throat> we have a Gaussian wave function here in the ground state, and the width of this Gaussian wave function, that's delta Z. And you can write delta Z as um, square root of h bar divided by 2m nu. Okay, and so we introduce, instead of the classical position, we introduce the position of my atom in the trap in terms of an operator. And then, remember yesterday, we started to look at the Lambdicke parameter. So I introduce now this Lambdicke parameter. So that's a very important quantity. Eta, and this is defined as delta Z times K. So you will see it, that's exactly what appears here, delta Z times K. And you can rewrite this. For instance, K is 2 pi over lambda. So that's just the wave number. So this is, you can write this as 2 pi times delta Z over lambda. So it measures, this lambda parameter measures how well is your atom localized relative to the wavelength of your radiation of the atom. And another physical interpretation I gave you yesterday, you can also write this lambda parameter in terms of the momentum. You can write this as h bar k divided by two times, now I call this delta p for consistency. Yesterday it was called p zero. So this is just the extension of the ground state wave function in momentum space. So you can also look at it as the Lambdicke parameter measures how much momentum you transfer to your atom. And there's yet another way to write it, which 
might be also illustri illustrative. You can write it as h bar k squared divided by 2m. So what is this now? That's the recoil energy that an atom absorbs when a photon is absorbed. So, and this again in units of the energy of the harmonic oscillator. Okay, so uh, I'm writing this in all these different ways because the slam Dicke parameter really has an important physical meaning. And in case you don't remember anything after lunch about this, you should remember the lamb Dicke parameter. Yes. Yes. Uh, so I guess you're thinking of the alignment or, or actually collected. Uh, you know. It's a very interesting and re relevant question, of course. So I haven't said anything about this. So everything I'm doing here is valid for either a single atom or a, or a collection of ions for a normal mode of a collection of ions. So this harmonic oscillator, these modes, they could be the mode of a single atom or of several atoms. So I didn't specify this yet. Both are possible. So. OK. Um, So now we, <clears throat> um, okay, now I write down. So we find HL one half H bar omega R times sigma plus plus sigma minus. So that's what we had so far. And then, yeah, I simply rewrite this as E to the I eta A dagger plus A. minus omega t plus phi, plus the Hermitian conjugate, so just to make it a bit shorter. OK, so that's now the Hamiltonian that we have. And you can, of course, uh, now do numerical simulations of this Hamiltonian, but there's a better way to approach it, or an analytical way, which is often the better way. Let's put it this way. And in order to find an analytical solution, we go into the frame rotating with the frequency of my atom. So if you think about a spin, a spin one half, precessing in a magnetic field, going to the rotating frame means you go to a, a rest, to the rest frame of the atom, so your uh, new rotating frame is now rotating around the magnetic field like the spin. So the magnetic field gives you the lab frame, and then you go into this rotating frame that rotates with the frequency, the Lamar frequency of your atom. So if this were a magnetic moment, a spin, then you would simply sit on a carousel and rotate like this with the spin. And now we do the mathematical uh, counterpart of what I just demonstrated you in a circus-like fashion. OK, so we want to calculate HL, a unitary transform of HL. And this is done in this way. So, and H0 is uh, the, it's the internal Hamiltonian plus the external Hamiltonian. So this is uh, just sigma z plus OK, and 
so you have to do some calculations. Uh, you know this from your quantum mechanics course. You can use Baker-Hausdorff lemma, for instance, to calculate this. So I'm not going to go into the calculation now. So there is a bit of paperwork involved here. And then I'll give you the final result that you end up with. And so we have HL is given by this. And then we find in the rotating, actually, this is not good to have this down here because this is very important. Rather write this up here somewhere. HL, so after some calculations, you find this HL can be written in this way, e to the i omega minus omega L. So what appears here is the difference frequency between the atomic precession and your applied radiation field. That's an important point. Sigma plus, and then you have e to the i eta, and now your um, <coughs> Creation and annihilation operators become time dependent. So this is A times E to the I nu T plus A dagger plus A times E to the minus I nu T. Okay. Plus the Hermitian conjugate of this whole thing. Okay, so now why does this help us? It doesn't help us yet, but you will see in a second that we're very close to an expression that again is uh, amenable to a physical interpretation. So now uh, uh, let's look at this exponential function here. And we now have to look at a real physical situation to determine the value of this eta here. So how large is this lamb ticket parameter? And for typical traps, so remember the lamb ticket parameter involves the trap, basically. How stiff is your trap? How wide is the extension of your ground state wave function? That's measured by delta z relative to the wavelength. So what you need is you need to know your trap frequency, basically, how stiff is the harmonic oscillator potential. And you need to know lambda of your radiation. So, and now if you look at typical situations, like optical radiation in a trap of one megahertz, then you find that eta is very small. So, for typical eta, which means eta is much smaller than one, you can do now an expansion of this exponential function here. So, expansion in this parameter eta gives you this energy term, of course, this remains unaffected, then this first term also remains unaffected. And so then I expand this. So the first term is just a constant, is one. Then I have plus i times eta times a dagger of t plus a of t. And I omit the higher order terms now. And then there I have the emission conjugate at some point. OK, so now we have expanded this. So nothing happened so far except some math with the physics background that eta is small. and. Now we look at the individual terms, and as I promised, we're very close to some 
a very useful result. So I'll just write this in a different way. So, okay, we have now e to the i omega minus omega l, so that's a difference frequency times sigma plus. So this is just this term here. And then I get a term e to the i omega minus omega l plus u, because this is a dagger of t. So that's this frequency here times um, <clears throat> Okay, I put the i eta in front of this term here times sigma plus. Here I have, uh, what am I doing? Yes, this should be right. So I, that's the first term. That's the second one sigma plus times a dagger. We're getting close. Plus a term e to the i omega minus omega l plus nu times t. So that's this one, sigma plus times a. And then these higher order terms that I neglect and then the Hermitian conjugate and then we close this bracket. So now why is this useful? Because we now can uh, look at what happens when we tune our radiation to different frequencies. So what we do now in the lab is simply turning a knob on the frequency of our driving field. So we change this omega L and now Look what happens here. If, for instance, if I tune, so I uh, give you an example now. So I'm looking now at these terms here, at these time dependent terms. This is not really red, but in any case. Okay, so as an example, let's tune the radiation exactly to the resonance frequency of the atom. And then you see that this term vanishes. This term, this is zero. So this term rotates, evolves at a frequency nu. So nu is your trap frequency. At this frequency, you have a term that does something. And also this term here does something at your trap frequency. And this term is constant. So what you do now is a so-called rotating wave approximation. So you're, we are in this rotating frame. And now we neglect terms that are fast compared to other terms. So they, they evolve very quickly. So if you look at typical time scales determined by this frequency here, then these terms average out, so they don't do anything. So what I am what uh, left with, if I tune the radiation exactly to, uh, to resonance, I find this is 1 half h bar omega rabi, and now this is just 1, and now I it's a little mistake and nobody noticed it. <laughs> I started with this phase phi here and somewhere I lost it. It's still here. Ah, uh, here it was lost. Yeah, yeah, I think, uh, so here it's already lost. So I'll 
add it here again. Then I have it here. No, uh, that's, that's not times t. That doesn't evolve. Sorry, that's plus phi. Okay, t plus phi. That's this. And then I still have it here. Okay, and then, uh, okay, so this term is simply one, and all that remains is sigma plus times e to the i phi. And these terms I simply neglect because they are fast rotating. And then I have the Hermitian conjugate, which is sigma minus e to the minus i phi. Okay, and this is now, uh, should look familiar to you because, well, this was on a slide yesterday, so we looked at single qubit operations. And what I showed you now, I treated the interaction between electromagnetic radiation and the trapped atom. And then if I tune the radiation properly, I do nothing with my motion. So there's no motion at all involved. I only rotate the qubit itself. So you can write sigma, you can write this also um, to illustrate this, so sig sigma plus e to the i phi plus sigma minus e to the minus i phi, you can rewrite this as, um, so that's sigma plus plus sigma minus, so this gives you sigma x times cosine phi minus sigma y times sine phi. <clears throat> okay, so you can rewrite this term in terms of sigma x and sigma y, and now you see when I write it in this way, I can rotate around the x-axis or the y-axis on my Bloch sphere. So remember, you can visualize these qubits as a point on a Bloch sphere, and these, the time evolution operator that you can derive from this Hamiltonian is simply a rotation on, of your state on this Bloch sphere. And you rotate around the x-axis or the y-axis, and you can choose this by choosing the phase of your radiation around which axis. So, just to illustrate this, so if you start, let's say, with a spin up, the spin up state, so that's, we start with a spin up state, then we let uh, the system evolve under this Hamiltonian then, and choose phase, the phase phi equal to zero. Then we rotate around the x-axis, so around this axis here. So we rotate, um, yeah, do a rotation in this direction, and then you can stop your interaction at any time <clears throat> and prepare a superposition state or flip the spin all the way. So that's exactly what Mauro demanded in his uh, last slide. So remember this Hadamard gate where you want to prepare superposition of two spin states basically and that's exactly what you can do here. So you rotate uh, in this um, configuration space around the x-axis. If this were a real magnetic moment that I'm treating here, and this whole treatment also applies to real magnetic moments, 
then this whole dynamics is very classical-like with some exceptions. Uh, so you have a spin that's oriented in a magnetic field. And your magnetic moment precesses around the magnetic field direction. And the precession frequency, that's exactly this omega here. And then we apply an additional field and look at what does this additional field do in the rotating frame of my rotating spin. So I sit on the spin, and now I see an additional field. And this additional field flips the spin from spin up to spin down or back and forth. And this is the description here is for any two level system. But, so it's also valid for magnetic moment, spin one half, but also for any other two level system. But it's easier, of course, to visualize a real magnetic moment than to have this abstract configuration space. So I can relabel the axis. I don't want to do this now by having here a real space and a real magnetic moment. OK, so um, how much time do we have for today? OK, so the, <coughs> uh, one of the important points is simply you have one knob in your lab that is responsible for your driving frequency of your field. And by turning this knob, you can create this Hamiltonian that makes rotations on the blocks here. OK. And now, but of course, we have other possibilities as well. So. so we can tune now the radiation to a so-called motional sideband. So I tune now the radiation, for instance, to such that omega L equals omega um, omega plus mu. And then this first term will vanish. So uh, now tune omega L such that omega minus omega L plus mu is zero, which means on a frequency axis. So if I got here the frequency axis of my light field or whatever it is, I have first I showed you the case. No, I just called it omega. I showed you this case here. And now let's use these colors that are not really colors. They all look the same for me, at least. Uh, so I tuned to this frequency. And yeah, so that's this. that was the first case. And now I tune to this frequency here, blue. OK, so that's this case. And all we have to do is look at this Hamiltonian, what happens. So then this term, will the time dependence will disappear. And these other terms, they will be fast rotating again. So there will be some dynamics. Remember, if you want to have the time evolution operator, you take e to the i times this Hamiltonian, basically. And this Hamiltonian has in front this time scale here, that's omega rabi frequency. And as long as omega rabi is much smaller than these terms, we have a slow evolution. And these fast rotating terms, they just average out. OK, so now we have <coughs> tuned to this so-called blue sideband. So all terms disappear, and only this one remains. So we end up with our HL. So 
So what do we have here? So then we have um, sigma plus a dagger. Oops. Yes, right. OK. Plus sigma minus a. And then I can do the same thing. I can tune to the red side band. So I choose omega minus omega L. Ah, there's a small mistake here. This is A dagger is plus, this is minus. So this is supposed to be zero now. And then I end up with the Hamiltonian HL and now again everything else disappears. Only this term is zero. So I have a one here. This is fast rotating, this is fast rotating, and all that remains is this term. Ah, geez. Okay, pluses and minus signs are Uh, let's see. Okay, so we have, yeah, that's correct so far. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Sigma, yeah, that's fine. Okay, so we have sigma plus A plus sigma minus A dagger. Okay, and now for some of you who have had some exposure, exposure to quantum optics might recognize this Hamiltonian or this anybody recognizes this Hamiltonian it's a very famous Hamiltonian it's called the James Cummings Hamilton yeah exactly yeah so that's a, and this was first introduced for uh, describing the interaction of a quantized light field with a two-level system. So this you, you, here we have a completely different physical system, but you can, of course, if you quantize your light field, you can do not you you treat also a two level system coupled to a harmonic oscillator so in that case the harmonic oscillator is a light field and that was this hamiltonian was derived in the case of two level system coupled to a light field or some electromagnetic field and it was the basis of many experiments in cavity QED, so like the experiments of Serge Charoche and other people in cavity QED. Okay, so uh, what I wanted to show you here is now by simply changing one knob in your lab, namely the frequency of or wavelength of your exciting light, you can create very different Hamiltonians so it's one knob is the frequency, the second knob is the phase. Don't forget about the phase. You have to control the phase of your field because this phase appears here again and determines what you really do. So frequency, phase, and what is the third parameter? Oh, you have a question? But I was asking you a question. <laughs> so let me finish this sentence. Uh, so three parameters, so you can change this Rabi frequency here um, by changing the strength of your 
the intensity of your driving field, and therefore your E field or your B field. So that's the three knobs <clears throat> by which you control this Hamiltonian frequency, phase, and amplitude. Okay, now I'm ready for your question. Because I'm considering a quantized uh, harmonic oscillator. Um, okay, so what we do is we look at the quantized motion of the atom described by these operators here. And then the precision operator expressed in terms of these harmonic oscillator ladder operators is just given by this expression times a number. And this number appears then here in this eta theorem. Uh, could you speak up a bit? I Uh, so delta z is a fixed number. And the position operator is delta z times a dagger plus a. So that's the position operator of the position of the ion. Yes. I mean, there's only one coordinate system, and we fix our coordinate system at the equilibrium position of the ion. So that's our z-axis here. And we define this as the zero of our z-axis. So z always gives me a position. So here, it's the position of the ion. It's, uh, it's just the position of the ion. Where does the ion sit relative to the exciting wave? Exactly, exactly, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, that's a very important point because uh, depending on the spatial phase of your field, you also get a phase factor over here. So depending on this, uh, yeah, where your ion exactly sits, it sees a different phase of your traveling wave. Well, yeah. For traveling wave, it doesn't matter. But if you had a standing wave, then it would matter. Yes. You get a linear property by expanding the expansion. Yeah. But usually in a system, like now an electron from coupling, and you don't need an external like uh, electron. Question is, uh, is there any reason why uh, that term is neglected here? Or is to the coupling to the field? The electromagnetic field is, is much more stronger than the. There is nothing else. That's the whole point. You're probably thinking about solid state systems. Yeah. And solid state systems, you always have phonons and couplings to every, everything, couples to everything. Here you have an isolated atom or a 
some atoms sitting completely isolated from the rest of the world. So that's the complete truth. There's no approximation here except, except the, the expansions that I did here. But the Hamiltonian is completely, uh, yeah, it's, mm, yeah. Uh, even if you have several ions, you can, as I mentioned before, you can uh, treat the collective modes individually by, by these operators. So that's still the whole, the whole truth of what's happening in the trap. So there's, yeah. in a harmonic trap. If it becomes unharmonic, then life is different, but we're talking about harmonic traps here. Yeah. Any other questions for today? Our chairman is busy. Yeah, there's a question. <clears throat> How do I do sigma z? Yes, interesting question. So one thing is uh, you can tune, if, you, if you're not exactly on resonance, you get an additional sigma z term. And you can easily imagine where this comes from. If you're in the rotating frame and you're exactly on resonance, you exactly rotate with your spin. But if you're slightly detuned, then you see a, a small change in time between your reference frame and your applied field, and that gives you a sigma z term. So if you're slightly detuned, you can have a sigma z term, or what you can do, you can uh, apply a sequence of proper pulses um, yeah, with proper waiting times, and I, I can show you a concrete way how to do this. Yeah. But it's an important question, of course, yeah. That's... I don't have any. <laughs> Okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much.